Hey, Raxer, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Happy Friday to you all. Welcome to a new session of Announce with Raxers. For those who are joining for the first time, uh, this is a community space where we share with passionate Raxers and they share about their experiences, their hack, their work journeys, at the cool projects they are working in, as well as many other experiences. In addition, I am Maria Hernandez, Developer Relations Lead at RAC, and I will be moderating this session. And as every Friday, it is a pleasure to be with you all. In today's session, uh, I'm going to be chatting with an engineer who joins the Raxer stage next to me every Friday, so you may already know him. <laughs> he has dedicated his career to supporting the creation of innovative IoT hardware product next to relevant startups in the IoT ecosystem. In addition, he is currently working as a solution architect at Rack Wireless, where he is empowering thousands of people to get started in the development of new products next to Helium. Welcome, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, wow, I'm on the other side today. Wow. <laughs> Hello, now you are a guest. You are no uh, moderator today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Weird. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hope everyone's having a great afternoon anyway. Amazing, there. amazing, for sure. And yeah, Jose today is going to be sharing a little bit about his story on working with, with different technologies in the IoT ecosystem as well as with different startups. And also, uh, he will be sharing all the things you need to know to combine the best of two communications work to achieve low power and long range communication for IoT solutions. Just in summary, uh, here you will learn about the basics of BLE, Bluetooth, the common mm -hmm. use cases, and how to bridge Bluetooth to LoRaWAN to expand the capabilities of your IoT projects using Wisblock and RAG Wireless Gateway. So yeah, I think we can get started. And um, for all of those who are watching us, uh, as every week, if you are doing the live session, feel free to leave your question in the comment section. I will be super happy to jump on them. So Jose, now you are our guest. <laughs> uh, maybe some of our, some of the viewers who are um, connected have many questions for you. So feel free to leave them uh, in the chat for the Q and A session. Mm -hmm. uh, you are a person with many years of experience in the IoT ecosystem with different technologies such as Bluetooth, LoRaWAN, Narrowband IoT, hardware, hardware design, firmware, many things. And also, mm -hmm. I can say that you are a pioneer in the um, Laura Laura White wow. community as well. Uh, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I meet you for the first time in the in the the things that the were. Things yeah, mm -hmm. I meet you in the things conference, but previous yeah. of that, I always see your photo and your name on the things <laughs> in the <laughs> all, forum. all the forums. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. So yeah, this is just one piece of the pie. So of all the things you have been done in the past year, so to get you know a little bit better, can you share about yourself, your background, your education, as well as how you got into this world of electronics and IoT? Yeah, yeah, sure, Maria. Um, so uh, I, my background is in computer science. I always loved computers. I, I started with uh, ZX Spectrum, uh, which was a 48K uh, RAM computer mm -hmm. and uh, like, programming it. I enjoyed writing basic and assembly code for it. Um, then later, so I, I've always been around computers. I've uh, had like the IBM XT, the 8086 machine. That was kind of my first PC machine. Uh, I then I did, I got into BBSs. So I started my own BBS. This was before the internet. It Amazing. was called build it in board systems so i was running my own bbs i was exchanging mail by something called fidonet uh which was based on phone calls so my bbs will call another bbs in hong kong late oh. at night to save money exchange the mail and then they would forward it like to australia and other places so oh. the email took like five days back then it was, <laughs> it was so very crazy Amazing. um so yeah, I always had that. And then I got into like full, uh, got my computer science degree and then uh, and then I got fed up of computers actually. <laughs> so um, I wanted to go into electronics. I, I enjoyed controlling like physical things. Um, so it was, so I was doing mobile app development at that time. This was around 2011 um, uh, and then 
uh, the iPhone 4S came out, and that was uh, and that was the first model with something called Bluetooth Flow Energy, which is what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And that that was the first time that you really made it easy to uh, connect your mobile phone, your apps, your software to physical things and control them. And like I was playing so much, I mean, I had. Um, I had toys, uh, remote control toys that I programmed. Um, I had Arduino, like lights flashing when I my app doing. So I really enjoy that. And that's why I got into IoT, uh, controlling things uh, wirelessly uh, with, with low power. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, but then, of course, I mean, BLE, you get like short range. So this is like 10 meters to now. Now you can do a kilometer, but it's really, you have to push it really hard. Um, but I wanted more. I wanted more distance, longer reach, uh, and that's that's how I got into LoRa. So I wanted, like, I saw, wow, I can reach devices a kilometer away. That's two kilometers away, even more. Uh, so uh, I was very, uh, very excited by this. Uh, it's all based on the same thing. So it's mm -hmm. all radio, all low power radio, uh, a lot of forward error corrections, so lots of codes to make this all possible. But uh, the, the the technologies are quite similar. Uh, so yeah, I got I got on the first Kickstarter for the Things Network when they launched uh, their first mm -hmm. Kickstarter. I got uh, I got a gateway even before they had their gateway. Uh, I ordered something. It cost me like two hundred dollars. I thought, oh my god, I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm spending so much money on something that I, I mean. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No one. Yeah. No one was doing it. it. Was like, and you had to go like through instructions and yeah. Uh, and I remember like to to add your first nodes to the Things Network. You, you actually edited the wiki file, a wiki page, and uh -huh. you chose your own address space. So you said, "Oh, my my device is going to use this address," and then there was like a long list of other people. Okay. Uh, just adding their addresses there so you didn't uh, collide. <laughs> so it okay. was a very manual process. Um, but but yeah, it worked. It was amazing. Um, you, you're, I had my gateway on a Pi, very weird, like wired up. Uh, I wish I had taken photos. Um, oh. and, uh, and then I was like walking with my device along the street, kilometers away. I was pushing my button and then and the <laughs> message was still there. It was impressive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of my background. That is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, like having the, the opportunity to test like a technology that is based like on the same principles, but just give you a few meters of range to them going for a walk, press a button and being able to receive this data. And that is not just that, like also being uh, in an area uh, I say in an area because, for example, here in, in South America, uh, we don't have like too many coverage about LoRaWAN technologies as is in Europe. And see that uh, that growth that have in those in that time and having the possibility to to whatever where you are. And if you have a gateway deployed, you have the access to that connectivity, which is like pretty awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, you also work like for different IoT hardware startups over the past years, and mm -hmm. you even found one yourself. If I'm not wrong, that that these yep. startups, um, it was in also in church with Laura One Technologies and Gateways as well. And can you share a little bit more about your experience working with these startups, and also share a bit more about the IoT projects you were involved in? Yeah, so when when I got into Laura, I, I mean things started clicking. So I was looking into some industrial projects with BLE back then, uh, but one problem was the reach. So we didn't. We were actually working at a hospital, and we wanted to measure temperature for on the water pipes. This is to monitor Legionella. Okay. So we wanted to see how the temperature uh, was changing, because you're. Uh, people in hospitals, maintenance people in hospitals, are supposed to go and flush all the all the taps, mm -hmm. all the water taps, to prevent the water like being stagnant there in the pipes for a long time. Okay. So you want so you you attach a temperature sensor to the pipe and you watch uh, for a decrease in the temperature, which means that fresh water has flown through the system, okay. and you pick that up and you record it. Um, so. So we were trying at the hospital with all this BLE stuff. The range was very small. We had to, to put like the, um, 
we had the sensors, but we also had like PLE kind of uh, gateways, which were Repeater. basically Raspberry Pis. Okay. But we had to place them very close to the sensor. So this was like we had we we filled the hospital with boxes. Like there were boxes <laughs> in the kitchens, in the community, the communal areas. So it was a mess. Uh, yeah. And then and then someone had to go and collect all this data because uh, the Wi-Fi was not available to us. So it was all recorded locally. Okay. Uh, but then, so when I saw Lori, I mean, it clicked immediately. It's like okay, this is going to be the solution. Um, and then, so. I got my first Laura devices. Um, uh, I started the company back then. I think I, I, I can see some business going on here. So let me let me start the company. Uh, also, so I could order like hardware and stuff like that, which was difficult to get as mm -hmm. well. Uh, we got my well, our first uh, modules, which were for, actually from Laird. Um, again, they had BLE already, so we could use some of the sensors we already had deployed uh, and kind of reach them to Laura. Uh, and then we, I built some PCBs. We we had some trials, and it worked. I mean, with one gateway in the hospital, we we placed it very high in a tower, the, the clock tower actually. It was an old clock tower, very very dusty. I remember, like it was <laughs> horrible to put it there. Uh, and do you, it was like power like over Ethernet or like how was yeah. the power or the connection for the that gateway? We had we had power there actually. Okay. Um, they because uh, they also use the clock tower to run the hospital radio system, the mm -hmm. the, the walkie talkies. Okay. Um, so they they had power there, but um, they didn't uh, like uh, have data, so we had to use cellular back then. Okay. Uh, so uh, we kind of improvised some gateways uh, with the Raspberry Pi again, uh, cellular data, um, and then uh, yeah, it, it will work. And with one gateway on the clock tower, we reached almost all of the hospital, including the indoor areas, which was Amazing. very impressive. There were some areas we couldn't reach, like the kitchen. They were, that was difficult. But uh, uh, yeah, that was um, the first first project I did in Laura. Um, Amazing. And from that, I mean, yeah, I joined PyCom after that. Uh, PyCom was a company that does all the networks, so cellular, Laura, Sigfox, um, and Bluetooth Low Energy as well. Um, and then um, I joined another company here in Newcastle doing some uh, more industrial stuff uh, and, and solar powered gateways because I began seeing, okay, this a gateway runs on five watts basically. So you can easily solar power it and uh, deploy it anywhere in the world. So I created something called the solar pod, which is uh, easy to deploy gateway. Uh, and then uh, COVID hit and, uh, and then so the the company here closed, and uh, but I was already talking a lot with Rack. Uh, I've I've known Ken for uh, the the CEO of Rack for a very long time since since before Rack was doing Laura, and um, and yeah, I was uh, hired almost immediately, yeah. and then uh, from there, yeah, I've I've. I was already looking into the Helium project, which was incredible. Nice. The growth was just amazing. Uh, no one has ever seen a growth, mm -hmm. a network grow at this rate. Uh, so yeah, I immediately got got involved. I had my first Helium gateway up and running. Um, so yeah, I just, just tried to be the first, always like, or, or one of the first. Yeah, that's my that's my plan. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Actually, it's funny now that you mentioned like the growth of Helium as well because I had a call this morning uh, with someone and we were talking about Helium and I told I told him like eh, I think they are in ninety five thousand gateways already. Eh, I saw the I saw the numbers eh, like three days ago and they were in nine in ninety one thousand gateways, but I'm pretty sure they already reach the 95,000 and we check the page and yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so it is my, amazing my bet is 100k <laughs> this weekend amazing this week. Woo. yeah uh, for it's, sure. it's incredible and also just uh like from all these years the the problem has always been the u.s so there was no coverage in the u.s you had to use cellular there and, mm -hmm. and cellular in the u.s is it's such a nightmare you have to have all sorts of certification and approvals okay. Uh, to be there, it's expensive as well. So when I saw helium in the US, I, yeah, that was yeah. completely made sense. 
Yeah, yeah. There, like there, there were many technologies trying to to cover the the US, uh, like also a sick fox, but yeah, Healy was the one who made it. Uh, yeah, so it's, far. it's it's the reward system. Mm -hmm. You cannot. It yeah. just changes the whole game. They have, exactly. They've, they've changed the game. Mm -hmm. And what what is the biggest challenge you face working with with the startups or in comparison, like a uh, large corporations? Uh, yeah, in a startup, you have to do kind of do everything, like a little <laughs> bit of everything, right? It's like it's all up to you, marketing and. Uh, <laughs> and coding uh yeah working with suppliers so it's uh, you got to do everything um which i enjoy it's it's great mm -hmm. i mean the company i was here working here in newcastle was very segmented so i i couldn't do anything i liked i, I spent okay. most of the day filling out spreadsheets so that that's not what i like um uh, so but it is a challenge and you got to work long hours there there's no i, I work at 3 a.m sometimes it's it, it just happens um if yeah so it it's that's maybe the challenge is uh if you want to have a stable life it's difficult <laughs> it's difficult yeah I, i'm glad i don't have like children and stuff like because it will be a problem i think yeah for sure and and also like right now, yeah, you are working as solution architect at Rack, and as you mentioned, you are directly involved with Helium products, mm -hmm. uh, and you are involved like with different activities uh, regarding Helium products. Maybe can you share a bit more about all the different activities you are currently working on, uh, like miners as well, like Helium developer kit as well, other things that maybe probably the Rack stars don't know. Yeah, so so currently I'm really really focused on getting as many miners done as possible <laughs> and uh, and solving all the problems that come with that. <laughs> We're trying to reach that, and you can't even imagine the problems. It's uh, it's completely crazy. Um, so that that's kind of my my focus at the moment. But uh, I'm I am very interested in getting solutions into Helium. I think it makes a lot of sense for developers now to start looking at Helium and really create big solutions um it can be like temperature monitoring the water pipes like i started or it can be um, um like supply chain monitor like checking the, the shipments and trackers and stuff like that yeah i mean there's a lot of things that can be done um so that's kind of where i'm going uh after the miners are all delivered okay. Uh, I think it is stabilizing now, so we are we are increasing miner supply to the market, uh, and and once we have that, yeah, we'll be looking into more, doing more, and we have five G next. I mean, that's even more exciting. Mm -hmm. So I'm also involved in that, and it's uh, super super exciting what's coming with five G. Yeah, Helium hotspots, Laura One of five G. We need solutions either for IoT then maybe virtual reality and things like that with a 5G. Uh, yeah, I think like yeah, Helium yeah. is trying to cover like the different technology connectivities uh, to to empower uh, more companies and entrepreneurs to develop um, yeah, uh, IT technology in general uh, based on this coverage, which is like amazing. Yeah, um, it's, it's a huge problem to, uh, to solve really because that's finding places to put the antennas is has been uh, always the biggest problem for any network um, yeah so the 5g is exciting it enables like rural networks people away from the cities to get coverage get internet access and stuff like that so that's that can be all enabled by helium amazing that completely amazing and and also like uh what what will be that advice that you can give to the people who is working in the, um, on the IoT ecosystem and are just starting to explore Helium technology? Uh, just um, just try it. It's, it's quite simple to get into. Just mm -hmm. You can get the WizBlock kit, of course. Uh, <laughs> that's that's what we sell. We have, it comes with all the modules you need if you can connect. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so, it comes with the LoRa part. It comes with Bluetooth, so you can bridge stuff like I'm going to talk about today. You can uh, you can uh, attach pre-existing sensors. You can create your own sensors, and then you can find enclosures ready-made for that. Uh, and once you have the 
kind of your first prototype you can quickly scale up you can uh, you can ask us or or you can do it yourself to, to do like 10 devices that's super simple to do and then once you really prove your concept you, then you you can just ask rack rack can you make a thousand devices like this and you say yeah sure it's our modular system we can flash it with your firmware you can do everything so it's it's it is simple to get into and if you don't like rack i mean that that's fine you can you can try Laura one is a standard, so any kind of Laura one device will work on Indium, and that's that's a great thing compared mm -hmm. compared to other networks as well. Yeah, like and also like right now, uh, Laura one uh, like Laura one technology have been growing a lot during the past year. Uh, there are different companies worldwide developing custom made uh, devices, and there mm -hmm. are many ready to use devices that you can connect to the network. Or if you are a company looking for develop your own or your own board, you can, as you mentioned, uh, look for rack products and build your prototype with Log is the perfect solution to to proof um, your proof of concepts in a quickly and easy and faster way, uh, mm -hmm. as well as cheaper and affordable way. And then you can also go to production with the same board, like, yeah, prototype and go to production uh, with the same. And also, if you need to customize something, just let us know and and we can help you through through all the process for sure. Yeah, understand. yeah, indeed. And it's it's not wasted like learning. It's not you're not you're not learning something specific to William. You're learning a valuable thing. So exactly. Laura one can be applied to many, many networks. You can even build your own helium if you want mm -hmm. to. Exactly. Um, so yeah, why not? Just exactly. Why not? why not? Why not? Why not? That is the um, <laughs> the the thing why not why not to do it <laughs> yeah i mean so, i would i would encourage like uh, people from the software side even not that don't have experience with hardware to get involved because um if you can build like a dashboard you can build a website you can you can also build the iot device it's not mm -hmm. too much different uh you need to understand a few things about batteries and stuff like that it's it's not really not too much different yeah i think it's just Spending time learning some things, putting all of them together, and being able to to deploy something by your own, yep. uh, like like um, our guest last session that he he was sharing with us, like uh, like okay, I know I know about the hardware development side, but I didn't knew anything about the software side, and it took me eight months to develop a platform, but I did it, and I know that this is not perfect, but I have the opportunity and the ability to make it work and provide a solution based on, on the things I learned and then you can improve it and get a team and many things. So yeah, the idea is to join forces uh, in some way and get some learning and yeah, start putting all the pieces together. And yep. cool. And also like you have been working like with the startups that as you say, and when you work on a startup, like you used to, to be involved in different parts, like marketing, and, yeah, distribution, programming, yeah, many things. And, and also you co-found your own startup. So it's even more, more job for, for, for you. And do you have any particular advice for those IoT entrepreneurs who are in an early stage of their projects, uh, like maybe any tip, uh, any tip and trick for them? Yeah, uh, just share your ideas, uh, learn and teach. Basically, that that's the best thing. And and go on forums. There there are a lot of forums nowadays, or our our wonderful Rockstar Discord mm -hmm. as well, where you can share your ideas and questions. So, so mm -hmm. if you if you're stuck on something, don't don't be stuck. Just mm -hmm. go and ask. People will help you. Um, and um, and then you establish your uh, friends, and you start having um more more knowledge um and then yeah go to conferences that kind of stuff as well um and, and get get some hardware i mean it nowadays uh, it, it's quite cheap to get a kit so it's not it's not a the end of the world and then if you have uh, in an if you live in an area already covered by a network like helium then you can you don't even need a gateway. You can just exactly. have a device. So yeah. with, with like, what, $20, $25, mm -hmm. you can get started. Uh, yeah. So 
just get started. That's that's the first step. <laughs> is is yeah, is showing up, <laughs> like they say. Yeah, if we compare like the cost of deploying a Laura one solution with the past, like today is nothing. Just a yeah, couple of nothing. bucks and you're ready to go. And you can have a prototype and then show it. Like if you know someone with a problem, um, just try to solve it with a simple device. Show it to that people, and then maybe they will help you develop mm -hmm. it, that into a solution. For and then sure. before you know it, you're running a company. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Maybe a uh, myth about IoT startup you, you would like to clear up? Any myth? Uh-huh. Um, maybe uh, any myth. Uh, that, that is a uh, myth. I don't know. There are no myths in IoT. <laughs> Maybe when, when in the past, when all the students say it's like we're going to reach this number of devices connected, that is, that is, uh, I still believe it though. So okay. it's like, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, uh, I think the timelines are wrong, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, people have been saying, yeah, we'll reach two billion devices, uh, that's that's not going to happen mm -hmm. by next year, as they were saying, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's true, but I think we'll we'll, we'll get to. A billion, two billion devices. Yeah. At least, like right now, with all the hotspots that we have for him by healing, <laughs> exactly. we didn't expect this. So, in yeah. some way, can help to those metrics. Nice, yeah, nice. exactly. Uh, yeah. Um. Actually, you didn't confirm me how much time can take you the demo, the presentation you prepare for us. I have like a list of question over here, but mm -hmm. I just want to make sure we have all the time to share all the things you prepare for us today. Um, maybe we can jump on a couple of few questions about LoRa architecture, LoRa one architecture implementation, and then we can jump to the, to the demo. Okay. Do you think it's okay? Sure. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So what are the considerations you keep in mind when defining an architecture of an IoT project based on LoRa one technologies? Uh, I mean, the first will be kind of the coverage right that's mm -hmm. kind of key for the for the solution and the other one is can i um what type of device do i need is it going to be battery powered i think the power supply is still if, if you can't power devices through the mains or through a big battery then you you have to worry about the power consumption mm -hmm. and can you reach that so you need and to do that you need to understand um, what type of microcontroller you're running, what what will you need to do, like which sleep modes you'll need to implement on your device. Uh, and that ties in with the data, so which... So I'd start by looking at what is the problem, what data do I need to solve my problem, how often do I need that data, do I need like every second or every minute, or can I leave with uh, data every 10 minutes, for example. Um, and then look at into coverage, look into the uh, power power solutions for the for the development, and um, and then basically code it. Uh, it's uh, some things will need. I mean, if you if you want to run, if you need like video cameras, I mean, it's it's going to be tricky, right? You're going to need a lot of power. And, it's going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. And again, if cost is a concern, then you need to, to think about that as well. Mm -hmm. so it, it depends on what the problem is. Yeah. Mm. And and what are like the, the main tools you use in the developments you perform, either on the software side or uh, on the hardware side? Um, so for tools, I, I like to use... Um, the platform IO or Arduino for, for LoRa projects, because that's where our stack is implemented. Mm -hmm. um, so for rack devices, I obviously I prefer that. Uh, I like to keep a, an energy monitoring device at all times, because I'm very, I, I'm especially concerned about low power stuff. Low power. So I'm, yeah. Tech device which monitors power consumption, I can get a nice plot of that. Um, and I have, I have a JTAG debugger. It's always super useful. Um, so kind of a Sager device, for example. 
Uh, some you can use the, our uh, DAP device as well, the rack DAP mm -hmm. device uh, for debugging. We should actually include that in the kit, right? Eventually, I hope yeah. we can do a debugger kit. Uh, although you can do a lot of debugging just using printfs, right, uh, on the on the serial. Um, and uh, of course, of like and, uh, the, a gateway. So if you need a gateway, you probably need you probably should have one, even if you are relying on surrounding uh, gateways. And for Helium, I would recommend getting. Um, just ordering a DUI gateway. So al although it's not going to mine HNT or anything, it is very useful for debugging. So you can uh, trace all the um, packets that go within the, the miner mm -hmm. uh, using a DUI gateway. And then you can see like any timing problems that your device has. So it's uh, for Helium, I would suggest that. Yeah, yeah, super. And and just like the last questions I have before we can jump on the on the demo and on the presentation you prepared today, mm -hmm. uh, how do you consider like the fusion of the different communities involved in Helium? Um, sorry, what the solution? Like, like how do you consider the the fusion or let's say the involve? Oh of the different communities involved in Helium. Oh, you mean like the crypto and yeah, IoT? Yeah, crypto, community. blockchain, IoT, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's amazing. I wasn't, I got into, mm -hmm. from the IoT side into Helium, and then I got into crypto, and now I'm like hardcore, hardcore crypto, <laughs> I'm like doing DeFi and all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I can see where crypto is going. It's really exciting okay. now to be in crypto, I think. Uh, it's going to, to change. It's like the internet at the beginning for uh, for financial stuff. Okay. Uh, and I think software developers will soon be able to code incredible financial tools, um, which were never before available, like uh, stuff like you can um, code up um, investment things mm -hmm. and uh, a new cur you can create your own currency through code. Uh, and use it as a reward system, for example. Exactly. Uh, so it's, yeah, the crypto side is really amazing. And uh, for people coming from the crypto side, mm -hmm. uh, you can see that uh, that IoT is also useful because you it's all about data in the end of, at the end of things. And uh, IoT mm -hmm. will create lots of lots of data. That that's the whole purpose of IoT. Uh, so the two together is is super powerful combination uh, in the future. And I, I, will, I want, for now, Helium rewards, like the hotspots, blah, 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 but I want to see someone creating a reward system for sensors as well and uh, that will be awesome. monetizing the data. That mm -hmm. would be super interesting. Yeah, for sure. And also, it's, it's nice to also see like how this other community in some way have been getting involved with IoT. They say, OK, I buy this Helium developer kit and didn't need I didn't know anything about coding, but I could just get the kit and follow some easy instructions, uh, upload a code, and I already have a temperature and humidity sensor running on the network that I'm also deploying, which is pretty cool. And at the end, uh, as you mentioned, the idea is to uh, create solutions under the network and not just deploy them. So yeah, I think that reward system for, for a network of sensors will be relevant as well to encourage more people to, mm -hmm. to deploy the solutions as well. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, data has a value. So for a, exactly. for a Legionella solution, data, I mean, the data points have a value. So why not um, do it that way instead of uh, signing contracts and stuff like that? Just um, uh, you can fund the IoT solution through Helium and then create your own mm -hmm. uh, like add-on value through exactly. a separate blockchain. Exactly. Uh, I think it will happen, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe some secrets you want to share? <laughs> I, I know people like there has been some projects already trying it. I, I know that there are people doing mm -hmm. it. We need uh, we need a bit a bit more development on the yeah. uh, crypto side as well. Mm -hmm. Super. So I think we can jump on the on the demo you prepare for today.
Yeah, actually, I'll, so I'll start with the presentation. I've got cool. a little uh, a little background on Bluetooth, so Perfect. I'll share my slides here. We have a couple of questions around here, but I think we can leave them for the Q&A session. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me see. Share my slides. In a window. And share screen. Okay. Yeah. So just a few slides to talk about this. this I'm really excited by the the possibilities of the Bluetooth combined with Laura. Um, and uh, let me explain why. So. Bluetooth started about 20 years ago, actually. Uh, you probably know it from like the headsets that people were using a few years back uh, for the phones, so like for when you're driving. Um, now, nowadays, all the headphones are, are using kind of the Bluetooth, and, and that's called Bluetooth Classic. So that's, that's the 20-year-old technology. It's optimized for streaming data, like audio. Uh, but it's also very uh, quite power intensive. Uh, the benefit is it works on the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is the same as Wi-Fi, and it's available almost worldwide. Uh, however, the classic uh, is, is not good for IoT. I mean, it, originally it started, you could find some like serial adapters for the classic Bluetooth, which you, which you could pair with your phone and then you could use it, but it's really meant for streaming data. So in 2010, the Bluetooth uh, SIG, which is the organization running Bluetooth, uh, added a new type of protocol called the Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, and this really changed the game. So this was now based more on a kind of packet data, so for short messages, and it was very low power. Uh, it took uh, some time to get implemented. So like I, like I said at the beginning, the first phone uh, to support this as was the iPhone 4S, which came out in 2011. Uh, the Bluetooth stack was kind of a weird thing. No one really understood what it was. Uh, and, and I think no one really saw the that now you could control something low power with low power connection. That, I mean, before people were using Wi-Fi, just to put it into perspective. And the Wi-Fi, as you know, it needs you need to send you need to tell the device how to connect to the Wi-Fi. You need to send your passwords. Uh, and uh, if you change your Wi-Fi password, then all your devices break. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's always been a, a big problem. And, and low energy changed that. So it made that new devices possible. So in 2011, I kind of backed one of the first projects for BLE. This was the, the BLE Shield for the Arduino uh, by my, my friend in Switzerland, uh, Michael Kroll. He created the... Um, an Arduino shield, so you could just send commands to this. Uh, you can see like the first, this was one of the first modules for BLE. Um, and you could tell it to commands and then you could write an app on the phone to connect to this BLE shield. And then through the Arduino side, you could then uh, flash LEDs and stuff like that. Uh, it was super exciting to do this. Uh, I was coding iOS at the time. So for me, it was uh, straightforward to do this. Uh, however, I mean, it's still uh, like a bit clunky. Um, what really excited after that was maybe the, the light blue beam that came out afterwards. This was another Kickstarter project. Uh, actually, it wasn't Kickstarter, it was another crowdfunding. But it, 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 they made it really small. So this is kind of a matchbox size device, uh, okay. really tiny, tiny BLE module. And they added the Arduino uh, chip the, uh, at Mega there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the amazing thing is you could code uh, Arduino applications on your phone. They will nice. get compiled in the cloud, and then it, the app will upload the code to the light blue bean over the air. Nice. Uh, and you had this prototyping space there. It was it was amazing. Uh, really, really nice device. Uh, actually, I became a distributor for this device. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was uh, really, really incredible. Um, Nowadays, then Apple uh, later launched the iBeacon. This is, this became kind of the standard for uh, location beacons. So an iBeacon is a, a, a Bluetooth device which just tells 
I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm ID, ID number 42, 42, and it just does that all, that all the time. The phone picks it up, and then it, it knows that it's it must be near that uh, device uh, 42. So it's kind of simple in concept. It's got some more complications thing. But it, it's kind of a basic system for location. And for apps, this was great because apps could then know that they were near something uh, like a desk or uh, another device or something dangerous, and they could the, the mobile apps could then uh, tell the user about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it also became very important in medical devices. I think we had a demo, uh, a presentation about connecting to a glucose meter for mm -hmm. diabetics, for example. That's a very popular application now. Uh, Heart rate monitors as well for when you're exercising or even yeah. in hospital. Smart watches. <laughs> then you have the smart watches, so kind of like the Apple Watch and the Pebble, which uh, I think the Pebble was maybe one of the first to implement mm -hmm. really. And smart home, you get um, the Philips U lights nowadays all have Bluetooth integrated, so you can control them directly from the, the app. You don't need any bridge, you don't need any device. Uh, Apple now has the AirTags, which are very small, and add a, so it, it's kind of a super eye beacon. So they uh, they they still transmit where they are with their ID, but now they become kind of a part of a global network. So all the phones know, okay, I'm seeing this eye beacon, and they know that belongs to you. So if you mm -hmm. lose something, someone with an iPhone can see that it it's close to that. Nice. Uh, also used in payment systems. Uh, and of course, it's still used a lot in software. So any kind of um, connection between the mobile phones and the computers, or it can be done over PLE. And maybe that, that last thing is, is really exciting for me. It's for industrial uses of VLE. So this is a, a bolt, uh, actually, um, this is an oil filter cap. So in your gearbox of your car, okay. Uh, you can find like a, an oil cap, so you remove it to, re to remove the oil. And this is actually got Bluetooth inside, so it can tell by the temperature and nice. uh, parameters, you can tell the oil needs changing. And this is used in rail systems, actually, so very big, awesome. very big systems. And BL is small enough to be inside this kind of bolt and run for five years. So it's perfect when you need to replace the oil, you can just replace the battery in your oil cap. Uh, so that's kind of how Bluetooth is used nowadays. Um, so you can imagine a lot of these applications will benefit from bridging to LoRa, like, like the oil system, for example, uh, uh, because Bluetooth is still short range. So to read the, the, the oil readings, for example, we need to go close to, the, to that mm -hmm. thing. You need, someone needs to go with a phone near it. Uh, and that's still annoying. So if you could have um, a small bridge in your garage or something to pick up those signals and then send them over LoRa, that would be, I think that would be good. And we also saw like the glucose meter, what you can do with that. So, mm -hmm. so you can start sharing your data as well uh, with the wider community. It's not locked to your phone anymore. And or maybe great. adding more capabilities to it as well. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, so uh, bridging is, is great. Um, so I'll just explain how, how kind of Bluetooth works, like uh, the basic concepts, um, maybe not everyone knows. So in Bluetooth, you find two types of devices. There is the central device and the peripheral device. Uh, the central device is the one who listens to any peripherals. So it's just scanning there for something called advertisements. And this is typically, you can, will be your phone, although they, the phones can change role, um, but uh, your phone is usually listening to uh, this advertising packets. Um, on the other hand, peripherals, so tend to be kind of the node devices in Bluetooth Low Energy, and they basically spend their day broadcasting a message saying, I'm here, I'm here, and my ID is this. Uh, and the ID will be a unique number, uh, a UU ID. Uh, once the central finds some, um, so the central can play two roles. The central can see, it can listen just for the advertising message. And you, uh, I'll show you on the next slide that you can actually add data to the advertising message. And that's a very easy way to, to send data over PLE because you don't need a, 
a connection. You're just sending, saying, okay, my temperature is like 10 degrees, and you're sending that every second, for example. Uh, the central can pick that up. But the central can also pick up another type of message, which is the connectable advertising. So this this is uh, the way the peripheral says, you I'm here and you can connect to me. And in that case, if the central then decides, okay, this is something I'm interested in, uh, it can uh, establish that connection to the peripheral. And then once the connection is established, they can exchange data more easily. And I'll talk about that next. Uh, so this is where it gets interesting. So advertising and scanning, um, it's basically this, the, the central device is scanning for peripherals and you can set the scan interval. So how often it, it's picking up those, mm -hmm. those signals. You have to remember this is all about saving power. So to save power, you need to keep the radio active as little as possible. So you need uh, to establish this kind of windows. And when the ra when outside of the windows, the radio will be completely off and not wasting power. Um, so in, the in this this slide is just to show that the peripheral devices will be transmitting the advertising messages in three frequencies. Usually, there are three core frequencies in Bluetooth. This is done to prevent uh, interference. So if you have a very strong Wi-Fi signal nearby that is using a particular frequency, the device still has a chance to connect through the other two frequencies. Um, one main thing here is to notice the advertising interval. So th this you can set this, and it's just how often does the peripheral transmit the advertising message. And of course, you can change this um, from 20 milliseconds up to 10 seconds. Uh, and the idea is, again, to save power. So you, mm -hmm. But then it takes longer for the central to pick it up so it needs so if you're doing an interactive app on your phone you don't want the users to wait 10 seconds until they can see the device uh, so yeah. in that case you change the, the interval um just a small a way of how the ble packets are structured um so there is the main the top one is the physical packet how it works how it's transmitted over the air and then within Within that side, so there is a protocol data unit. This is the, the type of data packets. And you can have different types of data packets. Uh, so one of them will be the advertising channel packet, which is called the advertising channel PDU. And you can actually include some a small payload there. So you can send 37 bytes on the advertising packet. So that doesn't need to be. Uh, just data that is being sent out there. It's like LoRa. So the advertising packet, you can imagine, it's like LoRa. You're just broadcasting it, and whoever listens to it will pick it up. Once uh, once we establish a connection, so there, there the security becomes uh, a thing. So there, there, the, the two nodes exchange keys, and they, they establish a connection, and they, and they stop advertising. Uh, again, this shows how, how kind of that is. So usually a device will be, a central device will be scanning, a peripheral device will be advertising on the other side. Once the central picks up uh, an advertising packet, uh, it sees if it is a, a connectable advertising packet. If it is, then it can do a connection attempt. The peripheral returns saying, yes, uh, okay, I see you, let's, let's connect. And then the two uh, establish the connection, they, and they dis do something called the service discovery, which I'll talk about next. Uh, and this is just uh, the way the data is structured inside inside the peripheral device. Um, and that's uh, so. This is the structure, the characteristics and service I just mentioned. This is um, it's just the so the the data inside. A peripheral device is stored as kind of a tree. So you start, it's organized into services, uh, which have a unique number, and then characteristics which have another unique number. And the, the grouping idea is to make uh, this kind of more standard. So you'll find that certain services have been uh, assigned by the Bluetooth SIG. So like a temperature sensor, for example, would have uh, a temperature service that is standard for all temperature sensors. Uh, and then they will have also a characteristic number. Mm -hmm. And then you know that 
uh, all devices implementing the temperature profile will will have that service. So this kind of makes it more standard. Uh, but you're free to use this however you want. You can create your own custom services and characteristics. Um, some characteristics will have um, a flag saying that they, they can be uh, the 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 data is updated, so you can listen for notifications. So when the data changes, your uh, central device get, uh, your uh, central device gets a notification, and then you can read reread that uh, characteristic okay. again. And that's kind of how it works. Um, yeah, so that's uh, kind of an intro into Bluetooth Low Energy. I'll I'll try to explain how how it all works next, and Thanks. I'll change my camera now. So let okay. me close this. And, and let's change to my desk camera if it's still working. Hope it is. One second. No. Mm, no. Did I break anything? Uh. <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me check here. Oh. Um. Mm. Let me go offline for a second. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. What? Why? Okay. Here, look in the, the comments. Yeah. Okay, hello, AB. Arnold as well over here. Uh, okay, I have okay. some camera problem. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'll just show it here. So, okay. Sorry, guys. Um, so to demo this, I've got a little device. Uh, this is the a Xiaomi device. It sends, uh, can you see it? it? Yeah. You can see the temperature and humidity there. This works over Bluetooth. It's very low cost, costs less than uh, $5. And uh, the really cool thing is it's been completely hacked by, uh, by a guy. So someone created a custom firmware for it. And you can change all sorts of things with it. This is pretty cool. So let me, let me try to explain how that works. Mm. Okay, so um, maybe you can see it. So this is the project. I'll share it in, in the comments. Um, and, and it's uh, it's designed for these devices. They're all BLE devices. And the idea is you can, uh, Usually, they will need to connect, so you need to establish that BLE connection to the devices to collect the data. But uh, this firmware enables uh, the, the device to actually send the data as advertisements, so making it really easy to, to pick up. So to do that, you need to first uh, run this telling flasher, which is kind of cool. So within the browser, you can... Uh, can try to connect to the device. You can then pair it. It will say connecting. Um, to wait a little bit. Let me see. Hmm. Okay, I think it's detected. Yeah, it's connected now. 
So within my browser, using BLE within the browser, you can see the the temperature and humidity there. Already, I can then activate it. And that takes a little bit of time. Mm. There's something broken. <laughs> Um, you didn't pray the life demo got. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah, let me try again. So let's connect. I think the problem is it's already paired. So usually it, you'll see a lot of options here, not just this activation key. Mm. Okay, so it, it got, okay. So now you can choose custom firmware, start flashing, and it flashes over the BLE connection. Nice. The, this custom firmware. Mm. Yeah. So this is just to show how that a very low cost device running very small, as you saw, running off a CR2042 battery that lasts years. Um, and you can still get data from it. How much is the cost of that device? It's around five dollars or oh, less. Yeah, yeah. We're actually. I'm hoping that rack might sell them soon because uh, nice. it's just a nice device to experiment with. Mm -hmm. And it's coming to an end now. <clears throat> okay. Okay, now let's try to connect to it. Mm -mm. And and another thing you can do with BLE is to provision the the devices. Um, so provision your keys, your Helium keys to the device. There is some firmware from Burn uh, from our team. We did that as well. Um, I think we can add that to the show notes yeah. as well. So once you've got the custom firmware, you can really play around with all of this stuff. Um, so you can uh, change how the display is shown, uh, how the temperature is shown. Uh, but, but particularly, you want to, to enable um, the custom advertising. Yeah, so it's already done. And then you can uh, send config. So once you do that, the, the device will be broadcasting the, the data now instead of having to connect to it. And you can read about how, what the format is for the advertising for packet is. And from then, from there, you can then connect your WIS block. And uh, I will provide some code for the WIS block. Uh, I still have to clean it up a little bit, uh, but it's. Um, it's using the the Blue Fruit library. I'll uh, let me change my screen here. Mm. 
<laughs> black? Oh god. Yeah, it's black. Uh, Let me see if it is an issue on my side. Let me try again. Let's wait. Okay, I can see it. Okay. Yeah. So this is using the Bluetooth uh, the Bluetooth library. Uh, you can uh, you can scan devices like this, and when it picks up a scan, you get a scan callback on your code. And from that scan callback, then you need to parse the data and and uh, send it over Laura. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I'll be providing code for this if you if you're interested in uh, in how to do this with your device, and um, and this I mean it doesn't need to be just this Xiaomi device. It can be uh, anything you've got at home uh, that has Bluetooth low energy on it and that the protocol is known. Uh, if you don't know the protocol very well, you can also uh, use uh, you can buy a small USB dongle. With uh, with a with a, blue, a Bluetooth um, microcontroller, I don't think you can do that on WizBlock yet, unfortunately. But yeah. you can get it. You can get something uh, quite cheap um, for to do a, what's called a scanner. So then you can uh, use a tool like Wireshark to go through mm -hmm. the Bluetooth protocol and see what data is being sent, and then you can you can try to decode it. Uh, that's for if you have an iBeacon or something like that, that, you can also try that because iBeacon is very simple and it's a well known format, so you can play around with that. Uh, another idea is to have your phone as the iBeacon in that case and then pick it up mm -hmm. from the Wiz block. So you can do a few things with this, this system. Um, yeah. And uh, once the data is there, yeah, it will go on Helium, which I can't show right now because uh, I can't run this demo. Um, okay. okay. Okay, nice. That's nice. Uh, we have a couple of comments over here that, that is like a, a great feature. Uh, and also, let's see. Uh, let's jump on a couple of questions over here. Uh, the first one that we have is from AB. Uh, what is costly sensing or sending in LoRa when you turn on an MCU running on battery? Uh, what is costly sending? Okay. When you're running on an MCU, what is costly? Uh, I guess it, that means in battery terms. In battery in terms, yeah, I suppose. It's just having the radio on, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, especially especially in the U.S. and things like what, where you can be maybe transmitting at uh, very high powers, that then you'll be mm -hmm. wasting more battery. Uh, so maybe try to make your data shorter. That's the best advice. Mm -hmm. And try to optimize the spreading factors in LoRa. They're super important. So your your packet sure. can take a few milliseconds, or it can take a second to send. And that's a big difference. For sure. Uh, here, here we have another one from Travis. Um, can you explain what is used for low power energy debugging? Uh, yeah, sure. So I use the the tool from um, what's his name? Uh, let me check. So let me get it out. So I've got this little box here. Uh, ah, that one. Uh, I forgot yeah, the name. Yeah, the Quitec. The Quitec. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OTII. So that it's super useful. So you can power devices from it, and it will graph, show a All plot day. of the of the power consumption. Very nice. And it also logs the UART, so you can uh, send some debug messages saying, "Okay, I'm going online," and then you see the peak, and you know exactly what what that That's is. Exactly. It's pretty nice. Yeah, we should uh, do maybe a demo on the Quitec yeah. eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. That would be nice. Um, what specific models of racks non helium gateways would you recommend, guys? Mm, that depends. Uh, yeah, it depends. So we have the edge gateways. Um, 
or you have the DIY gateways, so like yeah. the Raspberry Pi gateways. For development, I'd suggest the Raspberry Pi because mm -hmm. you can have full control of them. Um, but if you're deploying a solution, then the edge, of course, makes sense because it's ready-made. You get like the WSDM management system, so everything is, is done for you. Exactly. And those are already like built for, for industrial environment as well, either for indoor or outdoor environments. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. <laughs> when you start talking about like boutique, okay, Nokia phones. <laughs> yeah, Nokia At phones. At the beginning. Uh, okay. Uh, you and actually, actually, Nokia created the Bluetooth Low Energy. Mm -hmm. they, they were the pioneers exactly. of this. Uh, you already mentioned one tool over here, but we this can be a good question as well. What is a good way to sniff a, a Bluetooth protocol from a device that is not documented? So I use Wireshark, mm -hmm. yeah, with uh, there is some firmware for the Nordic uh, chips. It might even run on the WIS block, I'm not sure. I use a little uh, USB dongle for it, but um, it, it might just, it might run on the WIS block. I have to try it. Um, and then, what is, what's the name? So, so Wireshark connects to the, um, you run a small application which connects the, the Nordic through the UART to Wireshark, and then um, the Wireshark, like on like for TCP or uh, like networking, it also shows you the Bluetooth packets, and then you can choose specific packets. It's 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 a little complicated initially. You, you might get a little bit confused because. Uh, nowadays, um, you just have so many BLE devices around, and mm -hmm. Wireshark will pick them all up. So you, you have to be very good at filtering stuff. So you need to know, OK, this is the device uh, by the ID or the service number that it provides. So then you can select it and then just filter the packets for all those devices. I, I, I could just I could do a session on that alone, because it's it's super complicated to, to get Amazing. initially. initially yeah. We Maybe have two two session after this. This one and the other one from the from the the the, man the management of the battery with the Oh yeah, the Quitec. That would be the cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Um uh, another question over here. This device, I suppose the Xiaomi one, transmit uh, I beacon. Mm, it it's kind of iBeacon ish, so uh, yeah, it's not iBeacon protocol, but it's the way the same way, so the same advertising system. Um, so you could see it as kind of an iBeacon, um, but it's not iBeacon. iBeacon has a specific format that mm -hmm. tells which are the major and minor numbers for the beacon and stuff like that. So it's a little different. Okay, nice. And. Uh, another one from Xavier. Is it possible to make hinder positioning with Flora one and without BLE? Uh, yeah, it's difficult. Laura one, it's not ideal for this. You need a lot of gateways, so you can't do indoor positioning. Yeah, you need to do triangulations indoors with Laura. Um, BLE is BL is nice because you can set very low power levels on your beacon device. Exactly. So your peripheral, you can set it at like zero dBm, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. That the short the range will be ten meters, maybe, and or even less, maybe a meter. You can even go down below zero. Uh, yeah. Some people actually use BLE like as a proximity, so you really need to be close, like Apple does. Mm -hmm. So if you want to configure like your Apple TV, you need to touch your phone to the Apple TV, and that's how it's done. They just mm -hmm. broadcast at a very, very low power. Uh, so the device needs to be close. So I would suggest, and that, and BLE is so inexpensive. I mean, the, it's cheaper than LoRa nowadays. You can get a BLE device for under a dollar. Mm -hmm. Not not a whiz block, but you can. <laughs> uh, uh, and something to say is maybe the whiz block can also become an iBeacon. So that's something I didn't talk okay. about, but it's it's another way we could do that. Super. Uh, yeah, I think those are all the questions we have so far. We had a couple of conversations from the Raxers over the chat. That is awesome. Thanks for, for all of those who are active and joining us today. Um, I think we don't have any more questions. Jose, I think this will be like all for, for today. 
Uh, thanks, thank you so much for for bringing this session and explain a little bit more about the fundamentals of PLE and showing this demo and how to how we can bridge this information from this device BLE device to to our to technology with the WISLOCK. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, looking forward to that example code. Uh, as well to share it with the committee members yeah, so I'll, they can I'll start it up. with it. Yeah, it will be uh, when we post this, we will we'll publish the link as well. Amazing, so amazing. Follow it. That will be awesome. Um, I don't know if you want to add something else before closing the session today. Uh, no, I mean, this is just, it's cool technologies. I mean, it, it's not for the technology, but you will find use cases where this exactly. can be useful. So, um, just just have a lot of like a small library of uh, technologies you can maybe use and then once you need them it will click like like i did so yeah it's good <laughs> to learn more awesome actually we have a comment over here that is completely true that oh, this no, is you, why you. <laughs> he, this man got into iot yeah thanks to billy amazing no thank you so much uh, jose once again um and also for all of those who connect today uh, I hope uh, to see you, all of you guys and girls, uh, next week. And enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or night, as well as your weekend. And my best wishes to you all, and happy hacking, folks. Bye-bye. Happy hacking. And yeah, any questions, drop by on the Rockstars. Exactly. See you there. See you there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.